Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the press conference um, led by the Minister of Justice and in collaboration with the South African Law Reform Commission. Uh, and just to say, the journalists who have joined us today are quite lucky they'll be receiving this special edition of the Constitution. And as we celebrate the 25th anniversary of our Constitution, um, I think um, they are quite lucky to have this special edition leather bound uh, edition of the Constitution, so um, lucky to them. Uh, but that's not what we are here for. Uh, we are here for a very special announcement um, which will be made by the Minister and Justice Colopin respectively. Um, we are joined by Justice Colopin, newly minted from the JSC and is now a Justice of the Constitutional Court, who is the chairperson of the Law Reform Commission. We are also joined by the Minister of Justice on his immediate right, um, and the Deputy Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development. And the purpose of this briefing today is to um, share the work of the Law Reform Commission on very fo uh, four very important topics which have wide range effects on how we dispense justice or, or how justice is administered in this country in various respects. I'd like to call upon uh, Minister and Justice Colopin for a photo opportunity as Justice Colopin hands over the reports to the Minister of Justice. Thereafter, Justice Colopin will make a couple of remarks followed by the Minister of Justice. So you can just stand here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Justice Colopin, you have the floor. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for the introduction, Mr. Piri. Uh, Minister, Deputy Minister, uh, Secretary of the Commission, full time members of the Commission, and researchers. Uh, of the Commission. Uh, we've looked forward to this day for some time now uh, and the handover of the reports that was just concluded to the Minister represents an important phase in the completion of the work of the South African Law Reform Commission in four important areas that affect uh, our law but also that impacts on the daily lives of people in our country. The Law Reform Commission is established as the primary agency for law reform and the mandate of the Commission uh, is to be the principal body uh, undertaking law reform. We receive requests from the executive, from members of the public, uh, from political parties uh, to undertake law reform in specific and particular areas where lacuna in the law has been identified or indeed where the law may be said to be out of sync and out of touch with the constitution and the values that it espouses. The commission would undertake an assessment and would undertake if uh, merit uh, is found to be present in the request 
an intensive process of law reform. And often that process takes much longer than what people desire. Uh, people seek law reform to be much more speedy. But the process of law reform is time consuming uh, because in a society such as ours that prides itself on a system of participatory democracy and a system of proper public consultation, it may be said that the processes of the Commission are slow, but, but deliberately so, because it seeks to ensure to the greatest extent possible that all voices are heard, diverse voices, all views and opinions are canvassed. And in a society such as ours, it, it can't do that in a formalistic fashion by simply putting out a document in the public domain, saying to people the document is available on the Commission's website and you are invited to make a written submission. Uh, that may work for parts of our society, but it doesn't really work for the rest of society, in particular where people don't have access to the technology, where the technicalities of the law are often beyond them. And so the Commission undertakes a careful public participation processes. Uh, if it means travelling to far-flung villages and towns to hear people's views and their voices, then that's what the Commission does. And so the, the process, by its very nature, then uh, is extended. But we hope at the end of the day it is a process that properly reflects uh, the attempts of the Commission at least to hear and to consider all views ranging from academics, practitioners, those involved in the sector and ordinary uh, members of the public who have an interest in the law and in how the law unfolds and how it impacts on their lives. And so today uh, it is with great pleasure that we were able to hand over four reports to the Minister. Um, the reports cover diverse areas and without indicating any order of preference, the first report, which is Project 138, is the practice of Ukutwala. Now the practice of Ukutwala can be um, described in the most simple terms as the forced taking of a bride. And the report uh, recognizes that some features of the practice may have had a benign origin where a young man and a young woman fell in love and decided they wished to spend the rest of their lives together but there were obstacles to that happening either on the part of the family either on the part of protracted and stalled labola negotiations and so practice evolved benign in its origins where the young woman would be taken uh, not kidnapped but she would be taken and brought to the family of the young man and she would live there amongst the other women and that would create a situation where the uh, family of the young woman would be almost compelled to come and seek her out and to enter then into bona fide negotiations for the marriage to be concluded. But over time some features of that practice deteriorated to the extent that the notion of consent uh, in some instances simply lacked uh, people were taken without their consent. In some instances, young children were the subject of the distorted form of Ukutwala. And following its research and following a request to undertake the investigation, the Commission produced a report which uh, seeks to recognize, on the one hand, the benign and some of the positive features of the practice, but on the other hand, to ensure that the practice was not used to force people into marriage or indeed was used to uh, prejudicially impact on the rights and the interests of, of children. <laughs> and that broadly is the Ukutwala report. Um, the researchers responsible for ultimately putting the reports together, even though they carry the Commission's stamp of approval, are all present here today. And if there are more detailed questions, uh, they have been briefed and be willing to take on board those questions. The second report, Minister, is the report on prescription. And prescription is a controversial but important feature of our law because on the one hand, it um, almost acts as a guillotine in terms of when claims may be brought. That would be claims arising out of a justiciable dispute and that result in litigation. And our law has historically, and for good reason, set timelines within which those claims may be brought. And generally the period is three years. The problem with prescription laws is that 
different laws provide for different periods of prescription. In some instances, an action must be brought within six months, failing which the person would be non-suited to bringing the action. In some instances, two years. In some instances, periods between six months and two years. And so the idea of regularizing prescription periods to ensure uh, equitable access to justice is certainly an important one. But on the other hand, the need to ensure efficiency in litigation is also an important one. It, it wouldn't help if a claim was brought 10 years down the line. It may be a valid claim, but it wouldn't be fair to a defendant to have to defend a claim brought 10 years after the occurrence because documents no longer exist, memories have faded, and the idea of having a fair hearing in a court of law w would not certainly be possible under those circumstances. So, again, as in many areas of the law, it requires a fine balance. But the report also raises other difficult issues. Once a claim as prescribed, uh, is it incapable of being further enforced? Uh, should a uh, court take notice of prescription under those circumstances? And the report traverses a number of those issues and offers various options for law reform. In much of the work that we've done, there, there always isn't a definitive answer. Sometimes there is, but, but sometimes in the public consultation process, uh, two very viable options may emerge as possible routes for law reform. And the approach of the Commission generally has, to, has been to capture both those and to speak to the merits or otherwise of both those and put them out in the report so that at least the executive has available options and in the process that follows the uh, completion of the reports, there are options available with regard to possible areas of law reform. The third report deals with sexual offences, um, pornography and children, and it deals with the production of pornographic material uh, involving children, the dissemination of that material. And I think in a growing age of ease of technology, uh, one sees the, the impact that this could have on the broader society, but also on the, on the interest and the rights of children. And given that our constitution carries within it the paramount principle that the best interests of the child uh, matter and matter significantly so, it's an important area for us to consider in the context of our society. And the report uh, covers a variety of, of areas in how the law could best regulate that uh, with a view to protecting children, but also recognizing that children themselves may be involved in the production of this material uh, as children are naturally curious and, and how best to deal with that other than through the strict strictures of the criminal justice system but in recognizing that um, we need to deal with children in a way that recognizes their youth, their vulnerability uh, and the need not to stigmatize them permanently. The final report, Minister, is one that may well uh, evoke considerable public debate, and that's the report on legal fees and access to justice. And the Commission's mandate to undertake this work arises out of the Legal Practice Act. And I suppose it goes without saying that in a constitutional <laughs> democracy that prides itself on the rule of law and on access to justice, uh, people's ability to access the, the system of justice is largely dependent on the ability to, to access the legal system, to access lawyers, and to take their justiciable disputes to a court of law to, or to any other tribunal that can resolve them. But increasingly, the cost of justice has simply put uh, that right beyond the reach of many. And so it, it rings hollow when someone who's lost their home and who's been unable to uh, have his or her day in court not because the doors of the court are closed physically, but simply because access to justice is so prohibitive from a cost point of view, it undermines the very notion of having a right to court and in turn it undermines the very idea of a constitutional democracy uh, that can be held up as saying that we are all equal before the law. Some might validly ask, well, are some more equal before the law than others given the um, enormous disparity of resources and the significant inequalities that remain in our country. So that report seeks to address a number of issues. It seeks to ensure that 
the system by which we resolve disputes can become more efficient, perhaps uh, more cost effective, and a number of recommendations go towards the functioning of that system, the functioning of the court system, the greater use of um, mediation as a means to resolve disputes, uh, the greater efficiencies in, in court systems with regard to uh, how courts manage their role and how they ensure that matters that come through the courts can be dealt with efficiently but expeditiously. But at another level, it goes to the cost of legal services. And that speaks largely to the legal profession. And, and it seeks to uh, carve out a dispensation that would ensure that at the one level, at the very high end of the scale, those who can afford to pay legal cost as determined by practitioners sh should be able to do so. So if a uh, multinational company comes into South Africa and wishes to engage one of the top law firms uh, with regard to advice on a takeover, and if it would cost them an X amount of money and that's what they're able to pay, then many respondents in the work we've done said, you don't need to interfere in that process because that doesn't impact on access to justice. But for many that would fall within the lower and middle income groups, access to justice is, is a formidable challenge. And the report seeks to, to find means to reduce legal fees and uh, to place certain caps on the scope and extent of what law firms and legal practitioners may charge to people in those categories of users, but in particular when those services are being used, for example, in the magistrate's court. And the idea is that at that level there could be a strong case made for a reduction or at least a uh, set of guidelines that would regulate uh, fees. And in saying so, um, this is mindful that the legal profession needs to function and that sustainability is important. But I think at the end of the day, this is not only about one sector. It's not only about lawyers. It's about all of us as a society. What is it that we can? What is it that we must? And what is it that ethically we should be doing to ensure that the reach of the law is not taken beyond uh, the the people who seek uh, justice. And so I hope that report is received in that spirit, uh, that it's, it's not an attempt to regulate, it's not an attempt to um, narrow the scope within which lawyers can function, but rather it's aimed at a broader level of ensuring that ultimately if our democracy must flourish and if it must succeed and if it must deepen, uh, then ordinary people who are grieved and who feel a sense of injustice must be able to feel that they're able to access the mechanisms of justice. And I think most of us would agree with that. So, Minister, it's been a pleasure and honour for us to, to work on these difficult areas. But what it has done, it, it has taken us sort of close to the heartbeat and the pulse of the nation. It has exposed us to their fears, their insecurities, their hopes and their aspirations. And we hope in all of this we've put together something that could be of use to, to you and, and your government in taking the issues uh, forward. Uh, I think I'll stop there, Mr. Peary. I may have gone beyond my time, and I hope I'll also get a copy of that constitution. You've offered it to the media, but you will. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Justice Collip. And, uh The Constitution is in your head, so something you know back to front, so that you can keep that copy. Thank you. Um, Minister, we've heard remarks from Justice Collipin, um and essentially he said, here are the reports, what will government do with them? What's the way forward? I think your remarks may then elucidate members of the public on that aspect. Thank you. No, no, thank you very much, uh, uh, Crispin. Um, the Deputy Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development, um, Justice uh, Colapen, who is the chairperson of the Law Reform Commission, the Secretary of the Law Reform Commission, commissioners, researchers uh, from the Law Reform Commission, 
um, members of the media. Today, the Law Reform Commission releases um, for the public and for government four critical reports, which proposes um, recommendations with far-reaching implications for the law and various legislations in our country. More importantly, will have a significant impact on the lives of South Africans. Historically, there have been a major discrepancy between the content of the law and the ideal of justice. This is the task that the Law Reform Commission assists with. The content of the law must by all means possible match the ideal of justice. They are a bridge between that community and the law and to help narrow that bridge and the gap. The South African Law Reform Commission is a bridge between the people and the law and the commission is tasked with research with reference to all branches of the law in order to make recommendations to government for the development, improvement, modernization, or reform of the law. The law is not static, nor is it forever cast in stone. The laws that apply in a country must be dynamic and subject to regular review and improvement when the need arises. As society changes, so must the law, constantly improving, asking what works and what doesn't and if and how it can be improved. For the law to remain relevant and useful to society, it must be monitored and followed by extensive research and proper consultative processes. Government is therefore informed by pragmatic advice on the efficacy and desirability of the law. And government also needs to be alerted to any unintended consequences of such proposed legislations. Today we are presented with the four reports which addresses various gaps in our law. As a, the second project, the report on Project 142, investigation into legal fees, including access to justice and other interventions. The third project, <coughs> the report on Project 138, the practice of Ugutwala. The fourth project, the report on Project 125, harmonization of existing laws providing for different periods of prescriptions. These four reports go a long way in analyzing systematic problems in our justice system and in society and recommending an appropriate legislative remedy to address these challenges. The report covers issues which are at the heart of access to justice, the distortion of cultural practices, and the ability for claimants to justly be, for claims to be justly adjudicated, and regu regulation in relation to child pornography and access to such material. We welcome the research, the investigations, and the recommendations as set out in the reports as we consider the necessary legislative changes, amendment bills, and the regulations. And as government, we will go through the reports and um, process them through in our systems for necessary legislative changes and also to take them further for public engagement in those uh, legislative processes and to engage with all the relevant stakeholders, including other government departments affected by the reports of the Law Reform Commission. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Uh, colleagues, we've now reached that point where we can ask questions and uh, seek clarity from um, from the presenters today. So, I see Barry, your hand is up, uh, and I just want to get an indication from those who are managing online platforms. Takalani, yourself, do you have any questions there? Thanks, Mr. Yes, we, we do have uh, questions from online platforms. Okay, can we just start with you? Uh, can you give us five questions, please, from the online Thank platform? You so far, I have three questions, all coming from uh, Marvin Adams, who is a freelance journalist. And um, the first question is, has uh, the, the department, the DOJ, looked at the, the role of community advice offices? Uh, because very often uh, this is the first point uh, of access to justice. And uh, the second question is, has the department looked into paralegal and what role it would play in access to justice? 
And the last one from Marvin Adams is, does the department plan uh, to look into funding of community advice for this? Back to you, thanks. Okay. So just repeat them again, please. You went fast. My, my apologies. Uh, the first one was, uh, as uh, the DOJ uh, looked at the role of community advice offices, uh, because very often this is the first point uh, of access to justice. And the second one is the department looked into a paralegal and what role it will play in access to justice. And the last one, does the department plan to look into a funding of community advice office? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Barry will also take you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Justice Colford. Barry Baker from ENCA. Um, I'm looking at the, the proposed, uh, the recommendations related to the Sexual Offences Act, the consolidation of the various uh, criminal acts uh, that is already uh, uh, touched on or, or catered for in uh, different uh, pieces of legislation such as, and you mentioned here, the Film and Publications uh, Act as well as the uh, Cyber Crimes Act, which was actually welcomed when it was introduced by the various lobby groups. Um, can you just give me an idea of the rationale, the benefit that it would have to uh, our courts and of course the NPA who would be you know, seized with enforcing or, or prosecuting these crimes, of having the laws consolidated into a single Sexual Offences Act? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think we will do this. Uh, we'll start um, with um, the Department of Justice <laughs> questions. We are also joined by um, our almost retired DDG for court services in the room. So um, I will <laughs> defer some of the questions to him, um, then followed by Deputy Minister and the Minister, and then the specific questions that are put to Justice Collapin. Justice Collapin can answer, and of course, if Minister and Deputy Minister also want to provide clarity on those aspects, they also could. So we'll start with um, our Deputy Director General for, for Court Services on the question of access to justice um, and the role of paralegals and community advice officers. Please. You can just press the mic from there, it should work. Excuse Oh, okay. So can you come here, DDG? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the greetings to all. Let me start by uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, obviously, when the Legal Press Act was 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 uh, enacted, there was always a need to come with a similar legislation that will regulate paralegals. And I think uh, that discussion is still ongoing, uh, Minister. And I think is one of the outstanding policy pros under our department is running a program that looks into. A legislative framework that will recognize the role of paralegals in, in society as we know that paralegals provide a very uh, uh, economical and uh, cost effective form of uh, uh, representation to, 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 to communities. And I think uh, 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 very soon there will then be a process of the department coming back uh, with their proposals on the role of paralegals. And the second point, then I think that the will, will also uh, uh, reflect on it, is the role of the community advice offices. Those offices have been uh, uh, there for quite for, for, for a long time. And I think there have been a debate with National Treasury uh, to what extent can those offices be, be supported. And I think what has emerged in the, in the policy discourse is that instead of supporting community advice offices in terms of what they do on a daily basis. It will be easier if they engage into project, partnership projects with the government so that the funding is not to the community advice offices themselves, but is the programs that are geared to assisting communities, etc. Because obviously uh, the, the, the fiscal is stretched and I think uh, to support uh, the advice offices willy nilly in terms of their infrastructure, their salaries, whatever, will basically be unaffordable and, and uh, obviously not only unaffordable, unaffordable but also will will create a, 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 a burden on the on the national fiscal and on the taxpayers uh, 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 benefits but obviously there are avenues 
where community advice officers can partner with the department with government and the department and take over certain programs on access to justice which can basically leverage and assist and enhance the government's initiative to increase access to justice and i think uh, uh, there are which may be available from certain, certain quarters, including donor funding, which may basically be made available. And I think that's the area where we need to play a very uh, robust, uh, robust role in ensuring that we assist them to access those funds wherever those funds may come from, etc. But not directly from the fiscals. But I'm sure, as I've said, the minister will look into certain, will, will reflect on certain aspects which are part of the ongoing program in the department. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, Linda as well from the South African Law Reform Commission just before the, the Deputy Minister comes. Uh, Minister, Deputy Minister, Justice Kodabden, and all protocol uh, observed. Uh, I'm going to uh, respond to the first question around the role of uh, community advice offices. I think uh, uh, arising from the investigation into legal fees, uh, our recommendation is that uh, community advice offices, remember community advice offices are mainly meant by paralegals. Now the recommendation from the uh, investigation is that uh, these offices must be one of the structures in respect of which community services must, must be provided. Remember, community services provided by your attorneys, advocates. Now, the LPA current section 29, subsection 2, it only makes provision that uh, community services be, be, be provided in the Human Rights Commission only. Now, uh, arising from the, from the investigation, we're saying we must expand these institutions uh, where community services are provided. And we're saying that all chapter 9 institutions, including community advice offices, those institutions must be used as, as places uh, where community services must be rendered by uh, legal practitioners for free. I think that is my input. Thank you. Um, so there just seem to be a, a number of so many replies for, for, well, it was three questions, so I guess it's it's three people responding. Uh, I, think, I think a lot has been covered. Uh, just to highlight what um, um, Advocate Skosana said, the, there was a chapter when the, before the bill, the legal practice bill came to Parliament, there was a chapter on uh, paralegals, which was then taken out uh, because of us, it was before my time even, uh, I think it was objections from the profession. Um, but there was an undertaking that there would be legislation on that. There is legislation in our legislative program uh, for this year, although it's only expected to to come out um, towards the end of the year to in, for introduction into Parliament. But there is legislation on uh, community advice offices and, and paralegals. Uh, they are uh, an incredibly important a facility uh, obviously sustainability is a problem um, uh, community advice offices I think in principle won't accept any payments um, or can't accept any payments for their their services so the sustainability becomes more difficult there was a study done on sustainability by the Foundation for Human Rights um, which actually looked at uh, a number of, of these offices are already getting funds from government for other work, uh, Department of Labor, Department of, of um, Social Development, uh, Department of Health, etc., on HIV AIDS issues. So um, I just wanted to add those, those, uh, those points. We do recognize community advice officers and paralegals as extremely important. There will be legislation hopefully introduced before the end of the year. And um, there has been work already done on the issue of sustainability. Thanks. Uh, very briefly, I, th I think, um, Mr. Bateman, the, the idea, yes, is that one should ideally, for the sake of coherence, <coughs> for the sake of um, having one effective piece of legislation that encompasses all the various components 
of what we may regard as sexual offences um, has merit in it. It has merit from a coherent prosecution strategy, but it also has merit in terms of its public education potential. Uh, that somehow we we don't sort of create a hierarchy of, of sexual offences. If we believe in the integrity of people, their physical and otherwise their integrity, then the the concern must be an equally strong one across the board. Different interventions might be required in different areas, having regard to the vulnerability of people. But but that's the broader objective, as you correctly identify. And Mr. Lean Clark, who's sitting right behind you, might want to say a word or two about that. But I know we, we said there were three questions and there were three there were four responses, but can I just add to the question of, of paralegals, uh, its critical role? Because very often, and I've experienced this in my work as the head of the Human Rights Commission, but also as a judge, that often people who have a legal problem don't necessarily need a lawyer to resolve that problem. That doesn't mean that you offer people a different quality of service or a different quality of justice, but very often it must be ascertained by what is the nature of the problem. So someone who's having a difficulty in accessing a grant, for example, could well be assisted by a paralegal because the intervention at that stage may simply be an intervention with a SASA office or a government department to unlock a blockage. Uh, in the absence of a fully functional sector of paralegals, that person might be directed to a lawyer and that simply will, will sort of not work because the, the costs are exorbitant. And you, you don't need, you, you may need a lawyer for other purposes. And so I think that's the thinking behind that. And I think in the apartheid era, uh, paralegals, community advice officers played a critical role in sort of just being there to provide support to, to communities, to individuals, and in making the difference. So I'm, I'm happy and I think we support the initiatives of the department in this process with regard to the recognition of paralegals, the support of paralegals within a broader framework of uplifting communities as opposed to identifying that simply as a standalone uh, a service. Yeah. So, Dalina, I'm not sure if you wish to say anything else in response to Mr. Batemans. Yeah, thank you. Honourable Minister, Honourable Deputy Minister, Honourable Chair, and all guests. My name is Deline Clark. I'm a Principal State Law Advisor at the Law Reform Commission. And just in response to the question, if I may, the consolidation of all matters relating to child sexual abuse material, that's our preferred term to child pornography, is within the Sexual Offences Act. And what the Cyber Crimes Act already has done is to repeal the offences relating to child sexual abuse material out of the Film and Publications Act. And that's already then reintroduced into the Sexual Offences Act. So there's a dedicated chapter in the Sexual Offences Act. The idea is to streamline all matters with the aim of protecting children from being exposed to pornography or being used to create child sexual abuse material. And just in terms of your question with regards to the um, processes and the MPA and our court processes, we specifically look at procedural and evidentiary clauses, which we believe will make the um, ma manner of prosecuting such cases a lot more efficient and effective and also pr protect children from secondary victimization. So there are specific clauses in terms of that. We also specifically look at national instructions, directives and standard operating procedures for all government officials that are involved in this, including, and I think you would agree, that this really is quite a disturbing area of the law to be working in including looking at um, debriefing of all officials working in this difficult area of the law. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Clark, and for the responses. Um, colleagues, any other round of questions? Uh, Takalani, do you have follow-up questions? No, thanks. <coughs> we have uh, a question that is coming from uh, Brian Sukutu from The Citizen. The question really is just uh, to, it's on the idea, on the uh, timelines uh, in processing possible changes uh, to the law in the four areas outlined uh, or outlined by the Law uh, Reform Commission. And that, uh, yeah, that was the, the question. Thanks. Okay. Um, no other question in the room? All right.
Minister, can we give that one to you? Timelines from the executive. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and um, I can state that um, it's very difficult to put timelines time on this kind of um, reports because um, we still need to consult all the internal relevant stakeholders um, on these matters. And um, even uh, <coughs> when we have done that, we will also have to process it through the cabinet circles for the processing of the bills. So it's a bit um, very difficult for me to say within this period of time, um, this is what will have happened. But this is something which is at the top of our minds, which we will process forthwith without any delay, so that we are able to process them at um, what I could say it's a reasonable time, within reasonable um, time for because of the importance of the reports that uh, the commission has given to to us um thank you okay thank you very much uh ladies and gentlemen for your kind attention i think then that concludes our press conference today uh minister and justice colopin we've been asked to redo our photo shoot um this time we need to spread out the report so members of the public can actually see what um, the reports actually say so um, if we can just come back and and with no masks so you say spread out you want to yes why not four pictures? Yeah. Why don't you just do one one? You can carry two. You can carry two. Can't you can't just do two, two each? Yes. Two each is fine. Can't we just put it on a memory stick and I can give it to the rest? Like this. Carry two two at once. Oh, okay. No, just one shot. You can carry two at once. Okay. Like this. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, just some of the bit here. Sorry, can I get that glass? There we go. Best smile, best smile. I need a smile. That's true. That's my English. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. 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 Thank you.